Our next speaker is Dr. Amy Conroy Raymond, who earned her doctorate in molecular biology, uh, had a postdoctoral fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and is now a clinical researcher focused on Parkinson's disease and ALS. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Amy Raymond. Hello, hello everyone. Um, can everybody hear me? Great. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am in fact a scientist, a career scientist, and the reason I'm standing up here today is to say thank you. I'm sure there are other career scientists out in the audience, but most importantly, thank you to each and every one of you who is not a career scientist for turning out today, for showing your support for science, and to raise your voice saying that science is valuable. John gave you a little bit of my background. I've had a very fortunate career, not least of which I was fortunate to be trained at a time when I was. Um, following my training, I went into drug discovery, where I had the chance to work with my great colleagues, coming up with what we hope to be the molecules to treat diseases that we do not yet have treatments for. When my husband and I returned to Phoenix to be closer to our families, I had the great good fortune to transition into clinical research, where I work with wonderful colleagues, working with patients who, for a variety of reasons, volunteer themselves to try those medications that come out of drug discovery, to see if they are, in fact, the better treatments we all need. Collectively, that field is known as evidence-based medicine. And the thought I want to share with you today, and I love hearing it already today, is the concept of evidence-based policy. Yeah. I am a career scientist, but I argue each and every person out there is a scientist. If you are a child, or if you have ever been a child, you've done lots of experiments. We as professional scientists are very careful about how we collect data, very careful about how we analyze that data. But in its fundamental sense, it's really just that relationship between cause and effect. And this evidence-based policy concept is important to all of us. But we have to ask for it. We have to engage in that conversation with each other and with our legislators. We have to say that it matters. I don't mean to say that policy thus far has been some series of very controlled experiments. No, quite the opposite. Life is messy and wonderful, but not controlled. I ask that we all look back at policy in the conditions in which they were made and ask, were the results the desired effect? Are there desired effects that we could find with different policies? And the beauty of the evidence-based policy approach is that it works with every issue. I love seeing so many people out here today in support of science. But we all have a couple of particular issues dearest to our heart, I am sure. So it's not just that there are as many reasons to support science as there are people here today, but because we all have several issues dear to us, there are even more reasons to support science than there are people here today. My particular issue that is dear to my heart is the funding of basic research, primarily through the budget of the National Institutes of Health, the NIH budget. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And when I bring the evidence-based policy approach to this question, just like you, I rely on other scientists who specialize in this. I'm not an economist, but I look to people like Andrew Toole, the Deputy Chief Economist at the United States Post Office and Trademark Office, who publishes often in peer-reviewed journals looking at this question, what is the effect of the budget at the NIH? This budget admittedly has been shrinking pretty steadily since 2003. Indeed, boo. <laughs> but even under those conditions, his careful research, along with colleagues, has shown very clearly 
that for every dollar in the NIH budget, it translates to an $8.40 investment from the private industry. And I don't mean to say the NIH dollars are small in the big pie of research dollars. While that's true, there's a cause and effect that in fact is the results that come out of those NIH grants that inspire the investments from private industry in applied science that lead to the life-changing benefits that we reap today. That connection was not obvious. It took researchers at MIT to really investigate it, and they found that there's a 10 to 15 year gap between when the public gets to see the basic research and when the applied science affects us. And that is a long time. It's no wonder it wasn't obvious. But when they looked at it carefully, they can see that fully one-third of NIH-funded grants wind up being cited in patent applications for all the advancements that we enjoy today. I agree. So now is not the time to further cut that NIH budget. We still rely on the advancements of sciences. Each and every one of us is a scientist, consumes science, is affected by science, and cannot afford the future losses because we've long since passed the point of, you know, cuts could improve efficiency. No, no more. The cuts actually lead to smaller grants, fewer grants, and fewer advancements, training of fewer scientists like the future scientists we just heard from. So I ask one thing of you. I ask you to engage in this conversation of evidence-based policy with each other and to reach out to your representatives at all levels. Tell them cause and effect matters. Ask them what is the evidence that drives their policy and that you're really looking at the cause and effect both today and when you return to the polls. Thank you again for all of your support.